Good morning. Are we on? I'm not sure we're on. I am? Excellent. Good morning. Uh, I'm delighted to have all of you here this morning. I'm Chancellor Mark Fuller, for, uh, Chancellor of UMass Dartmouth. So, uh, Governor Healy, UMass Dartmouth is delighted to welcome you to the South Coast and to our campus to talk about one of the most pressing issues facing our society today, creating a more sustainable planet. Uh, we are delighted to welcome our distinguished guests, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, Secretary Howe, uh, Secretary Tepper, and Climate Chief Hopper. And we are very honored to have several members of the South Coast delegation with us who have been so supportive of the university and our students. Senator Montigny, uh, Representative Cabral, Representative Markey, Representative Schmidt, and our close partners, the mayor of Fall River, Paul Coogan, who I've already pointed out should have had a blue and gold tie on today, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mention that again, Paul. Uh, and the mayor of New Bedford, John Mitchell, who did follow the color scheme, thank you. Uh, and our Dartmouth town uh, manager, Sean McGinnis, and where is Sean? There we go. Uh, <laughs> Very good. Uh, we're delighted to have all of you with us today at UMass Dartmouth. With our deep roots in the South Coast, we're the marine campus of the UMass system. We're ranked number two in the Commonwealth. I apologize for the brag points. I had to insert them. Uh, we're ranked number two in the Commonwealth for social mobility and are very proud of how well we prepare our students for the workforce with 97% of our students employed or in graduate school within six months of graduation. We're doing that with a student population where about 50% are first-generation college students like I was, 41% are Pell Grant recipients, and 37% are students of color. Our colors may be blue and gold, but you'll find that we are also very green. We've been named one of the most environmentally responsible campuses by the Princeton Review for 11 years running. We're preparing future employees for the green for the clean energy sector and many green and blue economy jobs. Our faculty and students are doing groundbreaking research that is enhancing coastal resiliency, seeking to understand and combat climate change, and partnering with industry to support sustainable fishing and develop more ocean-safe plastics. For a campus that was built of concrete and steel in the 1960s, we're also making huge strides to reducing our carbon footprint. We've replaced 22,000 incandescent light bulbs with LEDs. That's just under 70% of all of our lighting. With support from the Commonwealth, we're installing hundreds of energy efficient windows, optimizing our power plant. We're also exploring the use of geothermal power when we renovate our College of Arts and Sciences building starting next year. You're going to hear today from several of our faculty and students, thank you for attending, faculty and students, uh, who are working on climate research and are excited about the discoveries on the horizon and the real progress we can make in combating climate change if we all work together. Governor Healy, we're, we're very warmly welcoming you to Coursera country. I was told to make my introduction of you very brief, so I'll just say that once again, that we're honored to have the 73rd governor of the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts with us here today. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Chancellor. It's a... Uh... Many thanks to you, Chancellor, to the administration, to faculty, to our students who are here today. Uh, we're really, really excited. I know that the LG and I are really happy to be uh, here on the South Coast. It's a place that we've spent a lot of time in and think incredibly fondly of. And importantly for today's discussion, a place with limitless potential, uh, particularly around an issue that really is the issue of our time and an issue, an area where we know Massachusetts can lead, not just this country, but indeed the world. And there's no better example of what our public universities can bring to this, uh, are already contributing to this, than what we see happening here on campus at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. It is incredibly exciting. So my remarks are going to be brief. I'm going to tell you the important people on my team who are in the room, more important than me. Uh, of course, starting with our fabulous Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll. Uh, we're also here today with some of our team, and it is a team. 
And I think that one thing we know about doing what we need to around climate sustainability, empowering the kind of workforce, developing the workforce to support that, and also promoting what is a huge and can be a huge e engine for economic development in the South Coast and around this state. We talk about wanting to build a climate corridor that stretches, you know, across this state. Um, we're going to do that by working as a team. So with us today, we have represented our Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs, Rebecca Tepper. We also have uh, our Secretary of Economic Development, Yvonne Howe, and a newly created position within our administration, Melissa Hoffer, who is the nation's first cabinet level climate chief. Now, why did we do that? We created this position because we know we're only going to get to where we need to be when it comes to meeting the, glo the goals for climate sustainability, building that resilience, you know, harnessing the potential that's out there, growing our workforce. Uh, we're only going to do that if we're doing it with real intentionality and focus. And that is the role of the climate chief, to make sure we're in deploying a whole of government approach, which, by the way, doesn't just exist within the realm of any governor's administration, it's cities and towns, which is why I'm so delighted to see my friends, our partners, and Mayor Mitchell and, and Mayor Coogan here today, uh, along with elected representatives. Um, and it also is going to involve partnership, too, with the federal government. And uh, another area where we're really looking to partner with is with our academic institutions, our research uh, universities, and with the business community. All of us working together is how we are going to get this done. So I'm excited to listen today, uh, to hear particularly from, from faculty and staff about the incredible programming that is happening and underway, uh, growing a workforce, developing a workforce, uh, building out resilience. We're going to make sure as well that we make the connections. Our state climate chief with, I just met New Bedford's climate chief, or climate resilience person. So, you know, that's what today is about, the start of a conversation. Appreciate the leadership of this uh, incredibly fine institution in this area um, and really look forward to uh, learning more about the important and ongoing work here happening uh, on, on campus. So thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, my friend and partner and your lieutenant governor. Thanks, Governor. Really great to be with everybody here on uh, on campus. I said to uh, the Chancellor, it's a little quiet without the students here, <laughs> but uh, it's great to be here uh, on a public higher ed campus as a public higher ed grad. I know how intrinsically linked the work that happens here is to what's going on in our communities. Also pleased to see my former colleagues, sounds very strange saying that, uh, Mayor Coogan, uh, Mayor Mitchell, and of course uh, our town leaders from the from Dartmouth here as well. Um, knowing the sort of the symbiotic relationship between what's happening on our public higher ed institutions and what's happening in our communities. And there's no doubt that cities are leading innovation when it comes to thinking about future sustainability and the work that needs to happen driving that innovation. And we've got some really good partners here to work with in that regard. Um, the governor and I, and I think the entire administration, is just so excited to be able to lean into this with the lens of, you know, intersection between economic development and climate and resiliency and workforce and what better place to do that here that one of our stellar public higher ed institutions who is leading that work already and I think can really help pave the way for being a catalyst for all that we need to do going forward. We know we have to work faster and deeper and more intentionally and that's why it's obviously terrific as we build out this team that we're all together to both hear from you, learn with you, understand how we can be really strong partners in this work. We're committed to it and uh, so grateful to be able to spend the morning with you. It was a lovely ride down 24. Not everybody says that, right? <laughs> but it was a lovely ride down 24. We look forward to taking the train down uh, when we get a chance as well and, and all those places are in peace. So thanks so much for having us. Looking forward to all the work ahead. Ready to, go. Ready to go. So this will uh, be a bit of an informal conversation. We obviously have a number of faculty, uh, staff, researchers, et cetera, around the table. And so I'll just kick off uh, a few topics. Feel free to ask follow-up questions uh, as the spirit moves you, so to speak. Uh, so maybe I'll start with the students uh, here today. Amanda just, uh, just perked up over there. Uh, 
What inspired you to study environmental issues, uh, and what change do you uh, hope to see in the future? So, and introduce yourself. Oh, yeah, sure. So my name is Alexa. I'm a grad student in the Biomedical Engineering and Biotechnology program, and I'm currently studying how we can use seashell waste to make a biodiesel. Um, my answer to this might be a little cheesy, but <laughs> my junior year, I was volunteering at a farm that provided food for local food pantries, and I, um, oh, in the previous year, Due to climate change, there were extreme weather conditions that caused not as many crops to grow. And so since I saw that climate change was like causing food insecurity across the south coast of Massachusetts for these food pantries, I kind of felt like we had to do something about it. So I really wanted to combine like my own personal academic interest with a pot potential solution for that. Um, so that was the first part of the question. Can you repeat the second part again? Yeah, I think, uh, the, and what changes do you expect to see as we move forward? Right, right. So I really want to see more resources for renewable energy. So right now, like I said, mine focuses on using waste as uh, a carbon source to make biodiesel. And I think it would be really cool if we could see more of that. But, you know, really all areas of sustainable energy would be cool to see advancements in, like wind power, solar power. Stuff like that. Thanks, Alexa. Uh, any of the other students here want to chime in on that? Hi, uh, my name is Danilo Zafili. I'm doing my PhD in civil and environmental engineering. Uh, I study offshore marine sediments and how they act under wind turbine loads. Um, I got into the more sustainable side of engineering. I was previously studying petroleum engineering and I, good switch. <laughs> it, was a, it was a very good switch. I was afforded the uh, opportunity to go from petroleum to offshore wind, and it just seemed like a brighter future to go down that route. And I look forward to seeing the expansion of offshore wind down the entire coast of the country. Other comments by any of our other uh, either faculty or uh, our students here? Uh, my name is Angelia Miller. I'm a master's student at the School of Marine Science and Technology, uh, researching changes to the federal government's multi-species bottom trawl survey in response to offshore wind and how we can mitigate those changes, as well as climate resilience planning um, and building a environmental literacy uh, network. Um, so what inspired me to study environmental issues was growing up and spending a lot of time in the outdoors, which I'm sure a lot of us do as environmental students. Um, but then also I had a really passionate high school teacher um, that taught us about seafood insecurity or seafood security um, overseas. And so that kind of brought me into the realm of commercial fisheries and sustainability within that network. Um, some changes I would like to see would be, you know, greater collaboration amongst all of the stakeholders as well as successful uh, scientific communication between those groups and adoption of some of the changes that we're promoting through the science. Angelia, where did you go to high school? Um, I went to Governor Thomas Johnson High School down in Maryland. Okay. Yeah. You should give a shout out to that teacher, I think. Yeah. Uh, she, she unfortunately passed away due to uh, breast cancer, but oh. God bless her. She was a great teacher. Yeah. Fantastic. Other comments? Hi, my name is Marcia Campbell. I'm a master's student over at the Marine Science and, Tech, uh, Science and Technology in the Department of Estuary and Ocean Sciences. Um, I'm researching um, the particulate carbon in um, the Western Arctic as part of um, Cynthia Pilskin's lab. Um, what inspired me to get involved in environmental issues, um, I had this really cool opportunity uh, during my high school years to go diving in some really pristine areas. Um, so it was really interesting to see the like good coral versus like the coral that's dying. Um, and so I was just really, that kind of kick-started it all. And then from there, I've kind of been interested in all the various different things that are happening, um, not just with coral, obviously. Um, and what change I hope to see in the future is just, yeah, the legislation and the science coming together to, you know, get 
to produce good um, things in the future. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on to a, a second conversation. Uh, the goals of sustainability and economic development can sometimes appear to be at odds. Uh, and I'm going to direct this to uh, Micheline. Uh, from your experience with the biodegradability labs, how can we build uh, initiatives that bring everyone together around these topics that balance uh, those priorities for a sustainable future? Thank you for your question. Um, my name is Micheline Labrie. I am the scientific lead overseeing the new biodegradab biodegradability lab at SMAST, um, a laboratory that was funded in part by the Mass Tech Collaborative. To answer your question, uh, it may come as no surprise here, but I think the key is education. Uh, from kindergarten to through PhD, we need to provide a curriculum that will create an innate understanding of how our actions affect the environment and uh, encourage discussion uh, be between students and encourage critical thinking and looking at data and all those wonderful research aspects. At UMass Dartmouth, we can continue to create uh, courses and discuss issues and fund students to continue critical research uh, on material science and biodegradability, particularly of plastics. The biodegradability lab serves as a crossroads between the public and private industries. And I feel very fortunate to be part of that lab. So thank you. So I think another interesting uh, aspect of that balance between economic development uh, and sort of sustainability really relates in, to the School of Marine Science and Technology to a large degree, but some of the work we do on sort of the coastal sustainability, and I don't know if uh, we have several very high-ranking uh, uh, folks in the room here. I know Ram Bala, uh, our chief research officer, does some work and has done some of that. Ram, you want to weigh in just a little bit there? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Chancellor. Uh, my name is Ram Bala. I'm the chief research and innovation officer uh, at UMass Dartmouth and I oversee the, uh, the university's research enterprise. Uh, a lot of the work that we do really uh, focuses on marine technologies. We support the U.S. Navy and the Naval Undersea Warfare Center extensively. We've received significant funding from the Office of Naval Research. We also extensively support the, the, the fishing industry in the South Coast and the emerging offshore wind. And we do this in multiple ways, including providing the sort of support that uh, Michi talked about, but also hiring um, really very talented faculty that focus in these areas. So those are priority areas, and uh, I partner very closely with our provost, uh, Dr. Hansen Hong. And um, the the biodegradability laboratory is particularly interesting because it was a perfect example of a private-public industry partnership and really drives the, the innovation economy in the South Coast. And we, can, we, we look forward to continuing to partner um, on that front. Um, and again, on, on specific areas of research, we have some really uh, highly respected uh, colleagues here that can chime in on the scientific nature of the work that they, that they do. Do you want to say something, Dan? On, on your marine renewable? Marine renewable, yeah. Um, I'm Dan McDonald, um, chair of the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department and also affiliate faculty at SMAS. But uh, um, in, in addition to these things, uh, I'm involved in wave energy uh, development, which is we're excited about offshore wind right now. Um, that's sort of where we are. But, but wave energy is over the hill a little bit. Um, but there's an enormous amount of of untapped energy in our oceans in, in, in form of waves. And so we've got a bunch of exciting initiatives here at, uh, at UMass Dartmouth that are they're kind of trying to tackle that on a small scale first and then, and then bringing that out to a larger scale. Again, the clean energy being more than just offshore wind, marine renewable is a perfectly good example. So we have wave energy converters and we have several faculty that are working on that technology as well. And would like to give a big shout out to uh, you know our friends at uh, in Fall River, New Bedford, in terms of partnering along those dimensions. I know that uh, we've had numerous conversations 
uh, with both of those uh, locations about ways that the university can really augment, uh, you know, all the coastal sustainability and renewable energy uh, in those in those cities that are we're great partnering, uh, great partnering with our colleagues across the South Coast. Uh, any other faculty or uh, or students uh, conversations or uh, comments on, you know, the the idea of sort of that balance between economic development uh, and uh, the scientific horizon on sustainability? I mean, uh, we have our dean from uh, the College of Arts and Sciences here, and there's obviously a lot of work that's going on there. Pauline, do you have anything that you'd like to add? I think only I, I could only add that, um, as everyone has said, I think both interests can be served simultaneously, and, and that's very clear in, in all of the research that, that's going on, for example, in our Department of Public Policy, um, in our Department of Biology with Conservation Biology. It, it's just become very clear that uh, sustainability actually supports economic development and, and does not need to be at, at odds with it. Thank you. So I know one of the, the topics that the uh, governor's office was very interested in was on economic development, workforce development, and some of those uh, activities. I'm going to uh, go back to maybe kick that off with uh, Dan McDonald, who's been uh, pivotal in uh, our internship program for the clean energy sector. And Dan, do you want to talk a little bit about those initiatives and what you see happening in that space? Sure, um, and that, that's an excellent uh, question, and, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about this, Mark. Um, but I think to to really push the clean energy sector forward, we need what I would consider to be diversity in education. So we need engineers that understand environmental science and climate science. We need, uh, and, and, and vice versa. And we need they also need to understand business. And our business people need to understand something about the engineering. This is a this is an industry that's just emerging. And it's, it really is so multifaceted because it's so plugged into the environment. We're not doing this in some warehouse or some manufacturing floor um, somewhere in the middle of the country. This is deeply integrated with our environment. So we need people that understand all facets. Um, and to get people into the workforce, um, we have engineers coming up. We're graduating a lot of great engineers. Same with business folks, um, you know, scientists. There's a lot of other pathways that are already established that might seem more attractive to them right off the bat. Um, and so we need a way to introduce these students to this, this industry that maybe doesn't have as much gravity out there when they're sort of circulating their resumes. And that's why the support that we have from the Clean Energy Center and from a consortium of local banks uh, to, to generate an internship program for offshore wind is so, so critical to this uh, emerging field. So um, we have, uh, within this program, there's 120 internships for students that are going to be well-paid internships, semester-long internships uh, over the next two years. Uh, between ourselves and our partner as partners at uh, uh, Bristol Community College. So it's a really great opportunity to introduce these students to offshore wind and not just offshore wind development, but all the supply chain, all the environmental pieces that go into that. So that's one initiative that we're, we're really proud of and we're just kicking off and, and really excited to get, get moving on. And then another aspect to, to mention uh, in connection with the wave energy work that I do. Um, I've had the, 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 the good fortune over the last four years to, uh, to mentor a team of undergraduates and graduate students in the marine energy uh, collegiate competition. So they're developing wave energy devices and competing with other universities internationally, actually. Um, and the, key, the really important thing that I like about that competition is that it's not just engineers. There's business students on that team. We've even had students from the College of Visual and Performing Arts to try to help us get the idea out. How do we best illustrate what we're trying to do? And so when they go to their competition, they have to um, they, they have to present a business plan as well as an engineering plan and really integrate it all together. And we've done really great in that competition over the last four years um, with, with several high, high place finishes. Um, so there's a lot of really exciting things going on. And I think, um, as you said, uh, Governor, earlier to, to kind of the opportunity for Massachusetts to lead in this sector, we're going to need to create these students or produce these students that are really well-rounded, that are going to understand all these aspects of, of, of this important sector. So, Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Do you have any follow-ups on any of that? Well, you know, one of the things is 
um, what do you need from the state? What, well, do you, what do you need from the state as you think about your programming and, and what you want to do and maybe what you want to scale up? I think, Micheline, you referenced uh, an important uh, partnership between a state quasi, the Mass Tech Collaborative, right, and creating this biodegradability lab. That's super cool. Um, but just to put it out to the to, uh, to folks here, what do you need from the state? Because we got legislators here too, and we got a budget coming up, so we're going to try to figure out what we can do. Really, I mean, I, I will speak uh, and say that uh, support in the form of programs, like several programs that are run out of the Master Collaborative, the Mass Clean Energy Center, that really engages uh, institutions of higher education, especially public higher education, because we serve uh, important constituents right in the South Coast. In fact, 70% of our students come within four counties of where we are, on neighboring mm -hmm. counties. So we are really uh, the conduit for them for right economic prosperity. And so programs that engage uh, students, faculty, uh, in supporting the, the, the clean energy uh, sector is, is important. And, and we don't, the, the, I'll come to the previous question for just one second. Uh, as you know, the, uh, fishing, the fisheries, play a very important role in the South Coast. So clean energy is clearly an important for our future energy independence. But there is a very delicate balance that, that needs to uh, be handled carefully so one doesn't disrupt the other. And that's where really the, the work that's done by scientists at the School of Marine Science and Engineering um, really provide some of those guidance and, um, and support really that, that ensure that both sectors thrive. And so uh, we look for continued engagement uh, of <coughs> Institute of Higher Ed programs that support training students, supporting faculty research, uh, those, those will be very impactful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dan, did you, were you going to say something? Um, I, I was, but uh, <laughs> so, just to follow up on my comment about the internships and that, that was you know, generated by funding from the Clean Energy Center, and that's, it's so critical for this sector because most of the companies in this sector, let's face it, offshore wind is not making a lot of money yet. Um, it's hard to hire, and it's hard to hire students at the, the salaries that we're able to give them so that they are, a lot of our students at UMass Dartmouth are working, you know, to put themselves through college, and so they maybe can't take an unpaid internship, um, but they, or, or maybe they can't take a, an internship for minimum wage when they're making, you know, $18 an hour at Home Depot. But this internship program allows them to take that risk. It's not a risk and they can get exposed to that, that, uh, that opportunity and, and hopefully become leaders in this field down the road. So, so I think support, continued support from the Commonwealth in areas like that is important. And I'd also just like to mention, with regards to my wave energy research, uh, the first significant funding that we had to develop that out was through the Seaport Economic Council. Um, and that was uh, about six or seven years ago. Now we're getting funding from the Department of Energy, uh, ONR, so a number of agencies on the federal level. But none of that would have happened without the Seaport Economic Council taking a risk on our, our ideas and our technology to move that forward. Not only has that been great for the development of this technology, but it's, it's, uh, there's been a, oh, probably 20, 30, maybe 50 students that have been affected by that research over the last uh, five, six, seven, eight years as well. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of roles that the state can play in, uh, in, in filling in some of these gaps. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan, do you have anything that you might like to add? You've been remarkably quiet down there at the end of the uh, table. I always, always happen to listen, but I'm happy to throw my And also, also introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, my name is Ryan Beam. I'm an assistant professor in civil, uh, the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And my focus is uh, geotechnical engineering and offshore, foundations for offshore wind. Uh, this is one of the discussions that I've had with some people here is the thought of kind of what the future of this industry looks like as we expand down the East Coast. I'm sure other states are having similar discussions, you know, especially with the large New York bite auction that just happened. And, you know, I'm, it'd be nice to, I guess, see some, you know, what are we going to look like in five years, ten years? How do we keep the offshore wind industry and the renewable sector 
in Massachusetts, in not setting up in New York or Virginia or the Carolinas as we move down the coast. And I think there's a, education is a very strong suit. If, the, if they keep coming back to hire UMass Dartmouth students, UMass Amherst students, and, and they are the key players in, in that industry, that will you know, ensure a successful workforce in industry up here. And so I think there's a lot we could collaborate on thinking to that future and how to develop to you know, put our flag, this is our, this is our, you know, our, our, our area of expertise. And I, I'd love to have discussions around that, that area. Well, we would too. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we were really clear, like, we're about Massachusetts competing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we think that this is an area where we can really compete hard mm -hmm. and, and we want to win. Mm -hmm. We don't want to lose any ground to any of those other wonderful mid-Atlantic states mm -hmm. um, who are yeah, out so there. I absolutely love my colleagues in New York and New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, we, and we do too. Uh, but we also want to make sure we do yeah. just what you say and, and plant our flag um, in this space. Mm -hmm. And that's really what today is about. And uh, appreciate, you know, we're both taking notes. Mm -hmm. We're really here to, to make sure we take it all in. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Can I just make a comment? I'm uh, Cindy Pilscon. I'm a professor of marine biogeochemistry in School of Marine Science and Technology. And I focus on carbon cycling in the ocean. And I just want to say that I think the state has, has done a lot by putting someone into your administration whose focus is going to be climate change. That, that's fabulous. We have someone that we can go to in many ways or at least focus on in terms of how we address these various questions and, um, and, and challenges that we have in Massachusetts, but obviously um, you know, nationwide. So I'm very happy that we have someone uh, in, your, in your administration that is focused on, on climate change. It's, that's really powerful. Yeah, very happy. Well, do you want to, just, just to digress for a minute, but it's pretty cool. Um, do you want to talk about Marsha's recent tour and oh. what, you, what you do? Because it came out of your lab, right? And yes. your work. Yes, yes, yes. Mar Marsha's my graduate student. We, um, she recently spent two months um, with another young woman scientist um, that I hired from Woods Hole, actually, in the Arctic on the U.S. Coast Guard ship Healy, which only makes two big research cruises a year to the Arctic. Uh, and it's also a Coast Guard training ship, so it's, it's doing double duty science and training um, young cadets that have just come out of the Coast Guard Academy. But the focus of our work, um, where I'm not the only uh, principal investigator on the program, there are nine of us from various other institutions, is taking a really needed and, and overdue snapshot of the chemistry, biology, and physics of the Central Arctic. So in other words, we know what's going on now, we compare it to the data in, that was taken about seven, eight years ago, and we know in that time already we've had increased melting changes in chemistry because of that warming and all the other processes that now many people who aren't marine scientists are fully aware of, which is, which is good. Uh, and so Marsha uh, and uh, another uh, scientist went and they put instruments uh, over the side to collect um, particles, essentially, that we do carbon analyses on. And so there were other scientists involved that were doing multiple uh, other operations. And in addition, there were other ships last year and this year from other countries covering other regions of the Arctic. So it's a synoptic survey of the Arctic and because no one country or one ship can cover mm -hmm. the whole region. So the Norwegians were out, the Canadians, the South Koreans. So there was a lot of activity last year and this year in the Arctic, yeah. looking at the state of the Arctic. Yeah. Well, that's great. And I just point out a, a global footprint, you know, that you have here um, uh, out, of, um, out, of, out of this campus. I thought that was terrific. So um, thank you. I'll talk to your former colleagues, because I know they've, they've done so much to, to lead in this space, and I'm sure you also have some ideas about yeah. what the state could be. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, Gary. So let me, uh, let me welcome your first visit to Greater New Bedford, and we're so glad that you were here, and Lieutenant Governor here. It's great to refer to you as Governor and Lieutenant Governor. Um, 
not even a weekend at this point. Mark, thanks for, for hosting us and uh, welcome everybody. Um, I just have a couple things I, I, I want to say. One, one generally about the the matter of um, the uh, of cl climate action, for lack of a better word, and then more particularly about um, the uh, the intersection of climate action and economic development. So, um, you know, we here in New Bedford have um, attempted to to lead when it comes to climate action, not just in Massachusetts, but even beyond with over the years, because we uh, we see the manifestations of of climate change uh, right before us. We have the largest levee on the East Coast, uh, of course, the, the Bedford Hurricane Barrier, which is a reminder all the time of you know, the problem of rising seas. But we also we see changes in fish stocks that uh, our fishermen report to us. We see heat islands in our cities. We see all, all manner of illnesses and asthma and other things that uh, and, and inland flooding that, um, you know, uh, tell us probably more um, more emphatically than other places that we've got to do something. So we've done that. We've been one of the nation's leaders on municipal solar, um, yeah, as well as in EVs, as well as in LED lighting and ESCO agreements and all that stuff. And we've really held ourselves out there as um, um, as as a place that um, you know can do something at the local level uh, when it comes to climate. But we also uh, embrace the idea that. Uh, Climate can also be climate action can also be an opportunity for economic uh, development. You know, the offshore wind industry in Massachusetts is what it is because of the Port of New Bedford. Um, it, I think you know we think about life sciences and why life sciences in Massachusetts here. Well, it's the you know the research research core in East Cambridge and beyond. Right, offshore wind is here because of the Port of New Bedford and it's proximity to the center mass of wind energy areas on the East Coast because it is the largest commercial fishing port in the United States and has a full organic port economy to support that industry. So, um, and as a city that is, uh, as I was just saying to the Secretary, um, that is not part of a major metro area, a city that sits on its own bottom and has to compete um, for uh, investment capital. Um, we see offshore wind as an opportunity uh, to do what so many other cities around the Northeast and Midwest can't. You know, think Flint, think Akron, think um, a couple in Mass Western Massachusetts that I won't even I won't, uh, name, right, will have, that have struggled to attract capital. This is a massively capitalized industry, and we have been doing everything we can um, to get out ahead of everybody else on the East Coast to, uh, to attract that capital. So that includes building the infrastructure out, I'm joined today by our port director, Gordon Carr, who is shepherding that process. But, you know, thanks to the support of the state legislature, your, your two predecessors in office, we've been uh, actively building out, actively modernizing the port in New Bedford, and we're probably about 75% of the way there right now. So the hard infrastructure as a foundation workforce, as we've been discussing, is a huge other dimension of it. Uh, Bristol Community College isn't here today. UMass Dartmouth has done a lot, but Bristol Community College has done a lot. The National Offshore Wind Institute, uh, which is the, America's first offshore wind training center, will open up next summer uh, on the New Bedford waterfront. BCC has advanced that. That's really important. The business development end of things, the business to business work, the marketing, the promotion, all that, the recruitment of businesses, which we've been actively doing here in the United States and in Europe for the last 10 years is something that we've, we've devoted a great deal of attention to. Uh, Jennifer Downing is the executive director of the New Bedford Ocean Cluster, whose job it is to knit all this stuff together. Uh, so we've organized ourselves in that way. Um, and, and innovation is, uh, is a big part of it. We want to be a place that uh, is not just a city of big shoulders, but big brains. And we know that to compete um, in a knowledge economy. We can't just be good at, uh, on the docks. That we'd be, we have to be good in the lab. And we have to be good in the incubator and have to be good at scaling. And, and so the work that we're doing now, for instance, with the, the Mass CEC to develop an innovation center on the waterfront is going to be key to that. And the work that we do with you, Mark, at UMass Dartmouth uh, will be key to that. A lot of this is laid out in a letter that you signed and, and I signed, and a number of us signed here uh, that we sent to the transition team. So, in answer to your question about uh, your uh, your open question about what to do, it's 
pretty much laid out in that that letter you you recall but um, but but that's just the start of the the discussion but there's a lot of work ahead um, the the, uh, the governor and I go back a, a long ways uh, I so you know, while I was uh, you know a, a year ahead of her in college as a washed up football player putting on weight she was competing intensely as the as the point guard and doing very well uh, at at that and so mm -hmm. as she is uh, uh, predisposed to be uh, to compete, and that's exactly what we have to do. Our job, uh, our focus is on out-competing every other port down the East Coast, right? We collaborate when we need to collaborate, but honestly, we're competing, and um, and that's and that's really, frankly, the only way that we're going to succeed is if you know we're oriented toward that. Because the industry right now is about to set down roots in the United States. So, and the Vineyard Wind Project is is starting. They just start, oh, started their lease yes last week, right? So they're about a week into their lease of the, the terminal on our waterfront. Um, that project is a three plus billion dollar project, right? That's about three NFL stadiums and capex, and it's one of the first of 17 projects on the East Coast in the pipeline and development right now. So, a lot of dough's coming, and uh, we've got to be ready for it. So. As Massachusetts competes, see New Bedford as the tip of the spear. Yeah, that's great. I think I don't want to take a minute. I don't want to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> hold, there, hold your mic up. I mean, I'd like, I, 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 um, Fall River obviously is heavily involved in the wind industry, also with Mayflower Wind setting up on our waterfront. Uh, and Bristol Community College being one of the catalysts for um, local change along with UMass Dartmouth. I think we can all work together to, to uh, formalize and strengthen our position with offshore wind. I'm very, very confident going forward. But climate, climate in Fall River is something that we really have to deal with in regard to solid waste. Um, going forward, that is going to be one heck of a battle for a city like Fall River. And I know Kim and I talked about this on the campaign trail. Um, it's something that we have to get a handle on. Um, landfills are closing at a rapid pace in Massachusetts, and it's something that's going to overwhelm us. We're not blessed. Um, I've talked to John about it uh, in, in conversations. We're not blessed like New Bedford. Our landfill is capped, and we're done. Um, we're working towards the transfer station, obviously, with recyclables being at the forefront. But that is going to be a climate issue that I really hope moves to the center of your desk also, because all the communities in Massachusetts are going to be struggling with this, and there's got to be a, a better way to do it than just bury trash in the dirt. And uh, I have utmost confidence in our new governor and lieutenant governor and secretary that they can find a way to plow through this and, uh, and help all the communities in Massachusetts, because I believe that's a statewide issue that is very, very climate-centric, and we're going to move on that. That would be great for Fall River. Sorry, I'm campaigning for my town. <laughs> Thank you for that confidence. We cannot wait to dig into that. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Governor and Lieutenant Governor, thank you for making this one of your earliest visits. We appreciate it. We'll have you back often. It's our first visit, right? Uh, did we go anywhere on? No, we had business on Friday in the office. Yeah, no, this is business in the good. office yesterday. That even sounds so, better. Yeah. South Coast, our first <laughs> right. official. Right. Yeah. We will keep you very, very busy. Uh, <laughs> let, let me break it down, if I can, practically. When you say, "What can the state do?" and in, in, in essence, we are the state also. However, where we need the governor and the lieutenant governor. I think you will find this very frustrating, if I can be presumptuous enough to assume that. Um, on Beacon Hill, everything is a Christmas tree. You didn't have to encounter, you didn't encounter that as much in your prior role as you will uh, this day forward. And I'll give you perhaps the most egregious example of that. We, some of us at this table, helped create the Seaport Advisory Council with the sole intention that it would enhance seaports. And of course, New Bedford does very well there because there are few that can compete. And for once, I can remember thinking about it after the legislation was passed and we had worked uh, hard on it, um, that this is one that you can't load up. You have to compete within the small number of ports, but if you have a pond out in Western Mass, you're not a seaport, right? Well, 
Fast forward to today, although perhaps that's a slight exaggeration, not really. Um, the money is now fragmented because everyone wants something from every pot of money on Beacon Hill. And as governor and lieutenant governor, what you can do for us, um, I think, although we may do the same as the 350 other communities, and in this case I represent more than just the city of New Bedford, of course, um, everyone will tell you their cause, everyone will tell you their needs. All we're saying in this area and in the areas that we know we can do better than most, we want more resources. And in the area that you're here today, the real nexus between uh, a, um, a clean environment and economic development, there are very few, if any, regions of the state that have more to sell. First of all, on wind energy, we're on Buzzards Bay and there's a hundred million dollar state facility sitting there. Yet everybody wants to participate and take the lead on wind. On commercial fishing and port development, everyone wants a piece of the Seaport Advisory Council, yet there's only one port in the country that's the most lucrative in the country, and that's New Bedford. So, as parochial as it may sound, let us do well and help us do well uh, in what we do best. And this university, I think, is perhaps the nexus, um, perhaps more than uh, any other institution. So w what do we do as a delegation? We've earmarked hundreds of millions of dollars in capital funding. But if we can't convince the governor and the lieutenant governor that we deserve a disproportionate share, it doesn't get appropriated. So it's a press release and it's fun, and I've done plenty of it, but I've also seen plenty of it spent because we've been relentless. What we're saying now, your mission to maximize the economic development as well as the environmental uh, protection, uh, the pathway through New Bedford I think is extensive and perhaps disproportionately so, which means what can the state do? More of what we've been trying to do as a delegation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. A couple of things, if I may, uh, Madam Governor. Uh, first of all, you've seen uh, the great team that's here uh, at UMass Dartmouth. Uh, and it, as always, it's all about leadership. And we got a keeper sitting to your right. We're very, very lucky to have Chancellor Fuller here. And uh, we want to keep it. Thank you. Se secondly, uh, Alexa on my left mm -hmm. mentioned that one of the defining experiences for her uh, was working on a local farm. That was for the uh, South Coast Y that operates a farm in Dartmouth uh, that uh, serves as a food pantry uh, for New Bedford. And uh, y y you are here uh, on the South Coast where we have a remarkable farming community in Akushna, Dartmouth, and mm -hmm. on into Westport. And uh, farmers want to be part of what's going on uh, in the environment. Farmers, more than anybody else, know that the environment is changing. Uh, we on our farm used to start our first cutting of hay about June 15, and we would hope to be finished by the 4th of July. Now, we start our first cutting May 20th. Two weeks, just in the stretch of 30 or 40 years. So uh, we see it. We, we, we want to be part of the solution. Uh, the state has done a lot of good work. We have a healthy soils uh, program, helping farmers uh, deal, making their soil more uh, carbon uh, <coughs> intensive. And we look forward to working uh, with your good team on future work. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Paul, you're invited to all future events. <laughs> 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 you know, we come in and work. It's great to be here. Yeah. That's great. Um, you know, I, I wonder if, um, if any of our secretaries want to reflect back on anything or have questions, too, of this of this group and we can we can go down the line um, if that makes sense sure. mm -hmm.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Rebecca Tepper. I'm the Secretary of Energy and Environment. This is my second day on the job, so I'm um, happy to be here and uh, lucky that we didn't hit too much traffic coming down, so we were relieved about, relieved about that. So that a lot, a lot has been said. I, I'm, and you know, the Secretariat is large and covers a large amount of uh, different uh, categories of, of topics. I, I actually learned yesterday that the, the people who are at the State House guarding the doors are DCR um, people. And I was like, oh, okay, that's one thing I didn't know. So um, it's big and, lot, and lots of different areas, and we're working hard to get a good leadership team ready to work with all of you in all the all the various areas um, one of our one of our priorities is is going to be offshore wind and continue to be offshore wind we've um, making some real progress with vineyard wind they're at they're, they're moving um, and we need to we need to keep pointing out that they're moving and that um, it's going to be an industry that is successful uh, so we need to work out some other other Things that are happening in offshore wind, but in general, um, it is part of our future, and we're going to be focusing a lot on uh, transmission to make sure that, in addition to the generation, we can get the power to where it needs to go. Um, that's both onshore and offshore. So we're going to spend spend a significant amount of time on that. So I'm really interested in some of the sediment work that you're talking about. Um, and uh, wondering whether anyone is doing anything on um, floating, um, or is that most of that research being done up in up in Maine? Uh, yeah, I'm on a. Uh, we have a NSF project for uh, f uh, multi multi line anchors for offshore floating wind. Uh, you know, more blue sky rather than direct mm -hmm. applicability at the moment. But yeah, we are working on uh, anchoring systems for floating wind towers there. Great. And one of the things I think you point raised in that, I mean, the jobs, we talk about, I mean, it's, a, it's an imperative that we deal with this. It's a huge opportunity on so many levels. And one of the things is, is jobs. And I don't know if you have a sense or need more uh, about, about the kinds of jobs. Yeah. You speak about transmission. There's a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done and supported. Yeah, I was, I was um, at a seminar about um, talking about what kinds of jobs we need in the future. Um, and I'm interested in sort of what do you see uh, going forward as the areas that need the most um, new people that, we, that, that currently are not going into, into those fields. Mm -hmm. Is it engineering? Is it computers? Is, it, like, is there something that we're, we're missing out on? that we really need to get moving on getting people interested in doing? All of the above, yeah. maybe? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it really is a huge undertaking, yeah. um, getting offshore wind moving. And it, it, people think of offshore wind terror. It's, it, we need people, about the, it's about the blades and the turbines. It is that, but it's about the infrastructure stuff Ryan is doing and Danilo, you know, all the way down into the seabed. Um, and, and that sort of, maybe not as visible to folks, um, but those jobs are important. The computer-oriented jobs are important. One of the things we've talked about with our computer science team is virtual reality training for the, for the maintenance folks that are going to be up on these towers. Get them, get them some kind of environment to be able to figure that out. That's going to take a lot of computer work, computer work to kind of manage the, the energy distribution and the systems. And that's just the technical and the engineering, as I discussed before, having the, you know, the business side of it that understands all the technical side of it, um, as well as, you know, the, the, the environmental science. It's really, it, it's really a broad checklist. So, sorry, what I couldn't of, narrow that down, but no, I think no, no. it's No, 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 what it's, kind it's of, um, what are your interns doing? So we're just kicking the program off, um, and we're, 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 we're in contact with a lot of the industry partners, uh, and I think they're going to be, so we haven't had, we're, we're going to place our first interns this semester, um, and they're going to be in everything from sort of the business side of it, maybe working directly with developers like Vineyard Wind, but also with, you know, engineering companies that are doing support that maybe are not seen by by the general public maybe as being offshore wind mm -hmm, connecting. Mm -hmm. uh, also, um, marine sensors and things, you know, the, we have a, a, a strong 
uh, economy or, or growing economy on the south coast uh, in terms of marine sensors and underwater vehicles and things like that that m you may not think directly connected to this industry, but they're going to be need to be there for surveillance, uh, monitoring, all these things. So we're looking at the industry rather broadly, um, but but I think we hope to place interns kind of across that entire swath, um, and also on the the legal side and the uh, you know the, the, there's there's a lot of aspects, public policy side, public relations, um, just getting. People love offshore wind until it's coming ashore on their on, across their their neighborhood, right? So there's there's a lot of aspects there as well. So it, it, it's far beyond engineering. I'm an engineer, so I tend to start there, but I don't want to end there. It's gone far beyond that. And I can I can quickly chime in and say, Michael Goodman had done some workforce assessment for the Clean Energy Center. Do you? UMass Dartmouth prepared the original economic yes. and workforce assessment for the Clean Energy Center prior to any of the solicitations. And so I think Professor McDonald has it right. There are gaps, I think, at every level of the workforce. I think what makes uh, offshore wind such an especially strong fit for our region is that there are blue collar as well as white collar mm -hmm. and professional opportunities mm -hmm. there. So a lot of the work in the early years will be in the construction and the installation. So we're going to need people from the building trades, but with a whole new set of skills. Mm -hmm. And we're certainly working with our partners here in the region, including the Bristol Community College and the vocational high schools, to get there. Here at UMass Dartmouth, I think we can play a special role in the workforce pipeline, as Dan said, preparing engineers, preparing trained business professionals, people who can deal with regulatory affairs, people who can do the back office stuff. This is going to be a multi-dimensional industry. Uh, initially, it's going to be a lot of offshore construction, which we've not done a lot of historically here in Massachusetts, but we've got a lot of work to do, but we're well on our way. Madam Secretary, please have one thing. So, you know, I've done an awful lot of work in this area. So is Bristol Community College. A lot of this stuff has been mapped out by yeah. occupational specialty. Because remember, the industry is very mature in Europe. It's been around yeah. for 30 years, and so it's pretty easy to define like, where the needs are and, frankly, where some of those needs will be, at least in the early years, um, fulfilled by others, right? Some pure Europeans and such, and we sort of accepted that as uh, the reality of it. But as, as things start to settle in here, we will have to prime the, the pump of the, the workforce pipelines you know, through some of the, you know, the programs that have been mentioned today. But, but, but like, like knowing where those needs are is pretty well sketched out. Yeah. And we can get to that information. So where do you, where do you think we are on the training? I mean, are we, are we, what do we need to do to make sure that people are getting the, the right training? Well, so there's, so there's a couple of different, so the pro, so programs are in, right now in their sort of gestational period, right? Because like with any workforce training, it's a chicken and egg problem. You got to, in order to bring somebody into the program, you got to have a job waiting for them at the end. And now because we're at the advent of the industry, that hasn't quite happened yet, but in anticipation of the industry's arrival, Bristol Community College, Mass Maritime, the primary two, and others have developed different programs um, and some over, with overlapping emphasis, um, emphases. Um, they're ready to go. So, so BCC's facility will be done, um, they believe, in by June, right? Uh, Mass Maritime's programs are in place. And one of the, I think, the most difficult aspects of get, uh, big challenges here is really sort of uh, getting people into the program. By that I mean, like, from a, an equity standpoint, actually pulling people into these programs and convincing them that, yes, this opportunity is real. Because right now, for many people, um, off the offshore, the prospect of offshore wind is abstract. A few months from now, in April and May, when people start seeing these massive components on the New Bedford waterfront, I think they'll start, there'll be some converts, right? And so people will actually start to say, oh yeah, that's, you know, they're not making this up, right? That those, uh, that, that, that blade is gigantic, right? Um, and I think things will start to, to move then, but, you know, actually the, the work of actual recruitment is, is, is going to be, a, have to be a granular hands-on effort in our neighborhoods and Fall River and, and other cities as well. And that's, that's, that's just very labor intensive, but, but, you know, that's what we're, what we're doing here. Can I, can I add in one thing? Sorry. First, um, 
Welcome to Switzerland. Uh, we're between Fall River and New Bedford and Dartmouth and proud of it. And I think uh, there's no one more passionate than John on the offshore wind stuff and more knowledgeable on it. And I think he's done a great job for New Bedford. And I do uh, agree with the mayor on the solid waste issue. It's not only in Fall River, but it's in a lot of communities. Uh, that's going to be a real problem. I think there's two things. One, just to pitch, uh, Vineyard Wind has a uh, career uh, day or evening uh, in New Bedford tomorrow to try to uh, bring up some support, support for some employees and trying to explain to them uh, their needs. It'll be their third one, I believe, that they're doing in New Bedford. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. And I'd just say on two things, um, the easiest way to sell offshore wind is, is um, we've been at the end of the energy highway for years and years and years relying on one source of energy from the Gulf of Mexico. We are now going to create our own hub and our own Gulf of Mexico here in Buzzards Bay and throughout. And I think that's the easiest way for people to understand that is very simply put it that we will become that if we do this right. Um, so on the macro level, I think that's the, one of the easier ways to do it on a micro level within our communities, uh, between Brayton Point and Mass Maritime, um, you have three or four educate, higher ed facilities that are dedicated a lot of resources towards this, and I think they're focused on it in a very, uh, in a very positive way and in a way in which is very practical. Uh, they've spent a lot of time in Europe determining what's important, what's not important, and they've invested a lot of time for that and money. So I think if you're looking for a place in which you can rely on a, uh, a real resource, it is down here on the South Coast to be able to understand those issues because um, there's been a lot of hiccups along the way, but I think they've overcome all of those things. Um, as far as sustainability, I just want to make one pitch that I think you know, I'm sitting here drinking out of a plastic bottle and I'm wondering, you know, one of the things is just recycling. Um, recycle isn't just about education, it's about convenience. And uh, one of my pet peeves is going to my kids' soccer games and the AAU tournaments and people just throwing bottles into the trash. Gas stations, soccer fields should all have mandatory recycling facilities so that people will actually put them in there and uh, things will happen in regard to that. But, just my simple, stupid thought, but that's it. Great. Thank you. I know we just have a few minutes, so we'll go quickly to Chief Hopper and then Secretary Howe. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. I just wanted to thank everyone this morning. This has been fabulous. I really enjoyed the conversation that we had um, beforehand as well, Micheline in particular, hearing about your fabulous lab. Um, and the remarks that Alexis and Angela made to start us off thinking about food security um, and thinking about sustainable um, oceans and the food security from our oceans and then the comments that we had from, from Representative Schmidt um, on the dynamic farming communities here. You know, that's really the other side of the conversation. We're doing a lot to reduce emissions and we also need to be doing a lot to be pulling emissions out of the atmosphere and sequestering it. So I'm very interested in all the land use ideas. Um, we won't get a chance to get into it, but if there are things that we're doing to, to measure regenerative farming practices or ways that we can approach that that is effective, that we have metrics and we can say what's working and we can be thinking about policies to put that in place. I'm all ears on that. We're going to be doing some more with that. Um, I also wanted to just comment because we've had a lot of remarks about, about the waste issue and that's really important too and it's connected with this economic development opportunity because if we start making these things out of the kind of stuff that can be biodegraded in the types of equipment that Micheline is designing, then we're going to get to a place where we're reducing the waste at the outset and then we have less of a problem dealing with the stuff after we're done using it. So end use producer responsibility, policies like that, we're all ears. Think about what can work and how we can make the data and how we can make the jobs case for it. Um, so the last point I just wanted to make, I really wanted to thank you in particular for mentioning the humanities piece because talking about it and getting the story out, like these stories about the hay, you know, this year there was no there was no second cut where I live. We went up to Vermont, that triples my hay price. The year before, there was so much flooding and it was so wet, we didn't have hay. 
So, you know, these are real problems for people, and we need to be thinking about ways to solve them and getting the stories out so folks are going to understand what's happening. You know, you talked about some very, some very real effects that are happening, too. So those kinds of conversations and, and how we can really help people understand on an everyday basis what it is, how it affects them, why it, why it matters to their kids, really interested in working with you all on that and the humanities, of course, have, have done that for us through the ages. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, what an honor and uh, what a delight to actually learn from all of you and hear all these ideas. Pauline was asking me, um, we were having coffee, about how it's going on the job. I am negative one week in the job, so um, I'll know a lot more next week when I start. But, um, but what a great way to start. This is not only the first event for them, it's my, my first event, period. So um, I think the most important thing for me is the question that Chancellor Fuller asked, which is a really important one, um, which is, you know, I think a very false narrative. A lot of times people say, oh, well, how do you, you can choose between sustainability and economic development? And it is absolutely not a choice. I think it is an and, and it must be both. Um, it's not only the right thing to do for, the, for, the, for our state and the country and the world to solve these problems, but also there's going to be a lot of opportunities created, a lot of jobs, a lot of new companies, a whole new set of industries. And so this is a super exciting area. Um, I think the other thing that's really interesting for me is um, when I think about just all the different, you know, different companies and industries and trends evolving in the world, a lot of those can be easily outsourced. They cannot be offshore. They can move to different parts of the country. Um, what's exciting about this conversation is this is very unique to Massachusetts. It's unique to our geography. It's unique to our ports, our, um, to our shores. And so this is something that can stay in Massachusetts, which is a, a great place for us to invest. The other thing that's exciting for me is that we oftentimes think only about Boston when we think about the state. This is clearly not just Boston, it's our whole state, which is why the, this corridor is so exciting. And the other thing for me that's really important is um, sometimes we think about growth, we think about all these very high-tech jobs, and no disrespect to all the PhDs in the room, but we have lots of different types of people who we need to employ and to have great careers and great development, and so this um, this conversation is about all different kinds of jobs, which I think is really important. So I'm super excited to dig in more as I start, and, um, and Representative Markey, I love that you mentioned recycling. I don't know how many people here have spent time in a recycling plant, but I've, we actually used, I invested in a company that did recycling. So I spent a lot of time there and excited to talk more about that and everything else on the table. So thank you all so much. Great, thank you. We should just mention that um, Secretary Tutwiler, our Secretary of Education, couldn't be here today, but is also part of this team as we think about this work linking um, our economic development, our environmental policies, embedding it in all the work, and certainly education and workforce. So we're, we're really excited. What a great way to start a Tuesday. <laughs> thank you, Chancellor, and, uh, and, and thank you to all for turning out and what will be a continuing conversation. So terrific. Have a great day. Uh, we're delighted to have today. you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.